right, I think we're on now. There we go. So the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, um, deal with the great, one of the great themes, fellowship. 1st John, uh, in a generic way, uh, deals with the, the fellowship that we have uh, with Jesus Christ. And so we're thinking about our vertical fellowship. The books or letters of 2nd and 3rd John deal with our fellowship with one another. And so we could put that on the horizontal level. 2nd um, John addresses who we are to consider to be in fellowship with us and those that we are not to be in fellowship with based upon uh, their false teaching. So it's more of perhaps a, a negative letter as we deal with those that are not supposed to be in fellowship with us. Third John, on the other hand, is a very uh, warm and, and loving letter, and it deals with those who should be in our circle of fellowship. And, and, and it even highlights for us those that we should not exclude, even if they're strangers, from our fellowship because we have a like precious faith. Third John being a loving and warm personal letter highlights three characters. <clears throat> and uh, we'll look at one of them in depth, but before we get to that one, I want to highlight the the others. There is, first of all, Demetrius. Demetrius seems to be a, a good, godly um, character, one who apparently is a uh, traveling minister, missionary. We learn that from Second John that there were folks who, who would travel from town to town and, and they would be on the preaching circuit, so to speak. And, and in Second John, there were, there were false teachers. And so there was the address there of who to consider um, welcoming and being in fellowship with. But in 3rd John, you've got Demetrius. He comes into town. He's a stranger. And there were some folks who were preventing him from being in fellowship with the church there. And, and then there was a fellow who is fairly famous, Diotrephes seems to be a, a church dictator. Whether he was an actual leader within the church or not, he certainly presumed to take that role. And as such, he was trying to prevent people like Demetrius from coming in to spread um, the message and the gospel of Christ. And he was also trying to prevent those who would support Demetrius from doing so. So folks like you, uh, Diotrephes would say, if you're going to support Demetrius or people like him, get out. So Diotrephes is very dictatorial in his uh, role within the leadership, if in fact he's an actual leader. We don't know that to be the case. So he's preventing these good, faithful teachers from, from coming in. He's even prevented the letters of John from being read publicly. He doesn't want John or any other apostolic authority to come in and try to, you know, take some of his own power. He's, uh, he's simply a power-hungry type of fellow. The third character, the one that I want us to focus our attention on this afternoon, is uh, a man by the name of, of Gaius. And Gaius, uh, John spends a lot of time in this letter commending Gaius. Now, we don't know exactly who he was. We do know from uh, earlier in the New Testament, there were three different people by the name of Gaius. One, it was one of the very few people that Paul baptized in the city of Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul mentions him. There was another man by the name of Gaius who um, was from Macedonia and apparently was one of Paul's traveling companions on the third missionary journey. And then a third Gaius from the town of Derby, Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, he apparently uh, accompanied Paul into his work in Greece. 
Now, whether this Gaius is one of those three or not, we're, we're not sure. Because apparently the name Gaius was a much like uh, John Smith in America during the Puri Puritanical time, or my name, Pena, in Mexico. It's just a, a dime a dozen, all right? So we don't know exactly who this Gaius was, if he was one of those three we mentioned, or if he was a, a, a different one. But whoever he was... This was a precious and beloved Christian, and I think he's got something to teach us. And I think that's why uh, God has preserved his character uh, in Scripture for us to, to learn about. We're going to read this phrase, a fellow worker for the truth, uh, in, in our text. And we're going to see it actually used throughout the New Testament frequently. And I want to focus that, that idea with, with Gaius. He was a fellow worker for the truth. But why should we focus on him? What does he have to teach us today? When we consider that all Christians have been given that great commission, just like the disciples were in Matthew 28, and when we recognize that every believer in Christ has this commission. Everyone has a part to play in this great commission. Whether it be we're a Bible class teacher or a preacher, an elder or a deacon, whether it be um, that we are a supporting role within the church, whatever it is, we all have a part to play in the great commission. We are all called to be fellow workers for the truth. Let me highlight a few. Um, few times where this phrase, this title is given. The Bible tells us that there were many people who were around the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is perhaps, aside from Jesus, the greatest theological mind, uh, theological worker, the greatest missionary, uh, the greatest church worker, preacher, whatever you want to, whatever title you want to give to Paul, uh, aside from Jesus, he's probably the best. And yet he is surrounded by many fellow workers. Priscilla and Aquila, Paul calls my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, Romans 16 and verse 3. Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, uh, Euodia, Syntyche, Clement, Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Justus, even Philemon, are all given the title fellow worker or fellow laborer throughout Scripture. And so Paul is surrounded by many people who are helping him on his journeys, his missionary journeys. And if he couldn't do it alone, but had a supporting cast for him, for his work, then, then how would we expect anyone in the church to be able to do it alone? The point is, we all have a part to play in supporting one another and being fellow workers for the truth in the carrying out of the Great Commission. Uh, I think it was Paul, 1 Corinthians 3 there, that said, I planted, Apollos watered, right? But God gave the increase. I did my part. Apollos did his part, and, 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 and you plug in any name, you plug in any uh, great preacher or, or a great elder, anything like that. They do their part, and I do my part, and you do yours, and, and all of a sudden we're, we're like a great uh, football team working together uh, towards the goal, and, and everybody's doing their part, and we grow spiritually, numerically. We, we spread the message of Christ uh, locally or abroad. And God gives the increase. And God helps us. That's what I see with Gaius. He is one of these fellow workers. Without him and people like him, Paul or, or Peter, or you just throw in any, any great name, wouldn't have been able to do uh, what they did. So I want us to think about this fellow worker. Three things that we learn from Gaius. We're going to consider his character we're going to consider his conduct and then his commission. And all of these characteristics are vital to any fellow worker for the truth, whether it be then or now. Let's go to 3 John now. In the first four verses, we read this. 
uh, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. From these four verses, we learn three things about Gaius's character. Number one, he has a great love for the brethren. Two, he is devoted to the truth. And three, he walks consistently in that truth. Gaius is characterized by his love for others. His own character of love is hinted at in part by the fact that he himself is loved so much. Now, uh, we all know somebody that's kind of a grouch. They're usually not well-liked or loved, are they? But the people that, that uh, we love so much, they tend to be chipper or they're positive. Uh, they, they don't uh, allow, allow it to be seen on their face when they're in a bad mood. Gaius. When we consider that John references him once in this letter by name, but four times he calls him either dearly uh, beloved, dear friend, of some sort like that. That must mean that Gaius is the kind of guy that everyone in the church loves, everyone in the community loves. Is that not what's needed for modern day fellow workers of the truth, that we have a love for the brethren? In fact, we're supposed to. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12, John says this, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another... God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. Then when we consider Jesus' words in uh, John 13 and verse 35, outwardly to the world, how are they going to know that we are His disciples, that we love one another? This is a characteristic necessary for all fellow workers of the truth, that we love one another. But we also see in these first four verses of our text that that Gaius is characterized by a certain devotion to the truth. And it wasn't so much that he walked around saying, I'm devoted to the truth, I'm devoted to the truth. No, the, the, the text of, of John here tells us that other people told us Gaius was devoted to the truth. I rejoiced greatly when people came and testified of the truth that is in you. They testified, testified about you, that you love the truth. Well, that's a characteristic that we all ought to have. A love for the truth, a devotion to it. Jude verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith. If you don't love something, you're not going to contend for it. You're not going to fight for it. Uh, uh, Paul says in Philippian, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see, uh, see you or and am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, contending for the faith. When we have a devotion to the truth, so, so much so that others can testify of us, we might, we might be able to follow in Gaius' footsteps here in his example. A part of his character is also not only does he love the truth, but he walks in the truth. He lives according to the truth. Verse 4, For I rejoiced, Paul, uh, John says, For I rejoiced when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Paul wrote that believers are to live the kind of life that shows a consistent lifestyle with what they believe, with what we believe. Listen to what he says in Titus 2 and verse 10. That they may adorn, put on, the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. That they may put on the doctrine. Not only that they believe it, just like James would say, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. That's what Gaius was doing. He loved the truth so much so he walked in the truth and he loved the brethren 
in the truth. And so he had fellowship with them. As we've considered the character of Gaius, think with me for a moment about the conduct. Now verses 5 and 6 of our text. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of, uh, of God, you will do well. His conduct, the characteristics that we just saw, love for brethren, devotion to the truth, and walking in the truth, then lead him to, to act, to, to have the conduct that we're going to see. He was faithful, he was thorough, and he was hospitable. Faithful. We could say another word, trustworthy or reliable. John commends Gaius that he is faithful in whatever he does, whether it's for people he knows or for strangers, whatever he does, he does it faithfully. He's reliable. He could be counted on. If Gaius said, I'm going to uh, fill up your gas tank for you before you leave town, he would do it. He could be trusted to do it. Paul ran into a problem with this idea of, uh, in, in Corinth, of people who, sa who said they were going to do something. They were going to share their needs to, to meet the needs of, of other saints. The Corinthians, they said, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it, even to the point where they were an inspiration to other Christians in the area. Oh, well, you heard what the Corinthians, they said they were going to pledge so much money or so many gifts or whatever. Uh, we should do the same thing. Problem with the Corinthians was they didn't follow through with what they had promised. Paul had to address that in 2 Corinthians a little bit, uh, and we don't have the time to go into that one. But that's not what Gaius was. If he said he was going to do something, he did it. He was faithful, trustworthy, reliable, and he was thorough. You see that word that John uses, you do faithfully whatever, whatever you do, you do it faithfully. Paul addresses that kind of mentality in Colossians chapter 3. And whatever you do, do it heartily, do it with all your might as to the Lord. Gaius was thorough in his support for these traveling ministers that were brought up in, in the second letter of John, and now Demetrius in, in third John, and Diotrephes says, no, we don't want none of that. Yea, says, come on in. Let me help you. And we'll see why here in a moment. A third aspect of his conduct from verses 5 and 6 is the spirit of hospitality with which Gaius addresses the various needs. And whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers, he's hospitable in his support, meaning that he shares what he has with those who serve for the sake of the gospel. That's what he was doing. Now, to this point in our lesson, we have seen the internal characteristics of a fellow worker for the truth. Love for the brethren, commitment to the truth, and integrity in his walk, his life. And then the external behaviors, faithfulness, thoroughness, and hospitality. He is convinced, Gaius is, he is convinced that he has a significant part to play in the spread of the gospel. Even if his part is not to go preach or teach and go on missionary journeys, even if his part is just to stay at home and to supply and help those who do those things. Thus his commission. Verses 6 through 8 now. Let's back up for the sake of the sentence and reread re verse 5. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for His name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that you may become fellow workers for the truth. The commission of this fellow worker. 
He doesn't appear to have been a missionary or a preacher, but he clearly recognizes he has a part to play in the work of the Great Commission. He, and, and he seems to have an appreciation for the importance of his part in the Great Commission. If you send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well, because they, people like Demetrius, went out for his name's sake. Gaius seems to view his job as making sure that those traveling ministers and missionaries, when they were there in town uh, where he was, that they were, uh, had, a, had a safe place to stay, that they had a secure place to do their work from, Perhaps he hosted them in, in his home. And then when they left, he made sure that they were well supplied for their next step in the journey. And finally, this phrase, on behalf of the name, or on behalf, uh, on, for his name's sake, for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus, Gaius did what he did, hosting, supplying these missionaries. He did what he did for the sake of the gospel. He recognized that his part of the mission was just as worthy as their part of the mission and just as important. No doubt Gaius took to heart the words of the Savior when Jesus sent out His disciples to spread the gospel. Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42, Gaius no doubt took this to heart. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Now, you see, you have seen... And if you didn't already pick up on it already, this is, uh, that's redundant. I said already twice. Uh, if, you, if you hadn't picked up on it yet, this is a mission, mission support type of presentation coming, okay? But I'm going to save you the begging because before I, I had even really asked, the Roland Hills congregation who is overseeing what I'm about to begin doing uh, received a check from the parish congregation before I'd even come to give the presentation uh, to help support this. So really I, I want to tell you uh, what it is that I'm going to be doing and uh, uh, covet your support in not only monetarily but, uh, but more spiritually and, and being a fellow worker in, the, in that way um, together. So, uh, number one, I'm, I'm here to thank you for the support that uh, you've already uh, sent and what that's going to mean for me and Jessica as we begin the year 2019, but also to invite you either to continue or maybe to be involved uh, individually if you can um, in, this, in this effort and this mission work that uh, I'm getting to do. <clears throat> A lot of you don't know me, um, at least real closely and personally. So let me give you a brief background um, so you know how we got to where we are today. Uh, I, I, I worked in, at the Fairfax congregation in Winchester for nearly 10 years. Um, met uh, Jessica, my wife, um, I'm going to four years ago, roughly. Um, we got married and she was living and working in Berea at the college there. Um, the Berea Church of Christ minister was retiring and uh, it just worked out. So we moved, I moved down to Berea, uh, began working with the Berea congregation. We were there for about two and a half years, and we have recently, at, at the end of April, we uh, stopped our work with that congregation so that we could move to Montgomery County. Our move to Montgomery County was necessitated by some family things that came up, some 
the tr some tragedy and health issues within our family beyond our control, but we felt the need to, to do that. Jessica continues her work with Berea College, um, but as a result of, of the move, I've stepped out of full-time pulpit work. And uh, over the last seven, eight months, uh, I've been on vacation. Jessica said, you gotta get back to work. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I, I've been kind of searching to find my, uh, my place, you know. I've been a preacher for almost 15 years, and what am I going to do now? I've been searching to kind of find my place. Two years ago, Jessica and I went to Costa Rica with a friend of mine from Fried Hardeman, Rafael Barantes. Rafael was the Spanish minister at a large congregation in Jackson, Tennessee, originally from Costa Rica. When we went to Costa Rica with him, it was unbeknownst to us, he was on a scouting trip and intended to go at the beginning of 2018 and start a preacher training school. While we were there in Costa Rica with him, Rafael, by the time we were done with our mission trip, Rafael had approached me and Jessica to come and live with, well not live with him, but live in Costa Rica um, with him and his wife to help with the Costa Rican Theological Institute and do that on a full-time basis. He had asked us uh, at the beginning of 2017 to come, um, move, and be there full-time, um, be the assistant director of this school and uh, instructor and, and all of those things. And during the winter of 2017, Jessica and I gave that some very serious thought. Um, and then some things happened that really forced us to, to change our, our, our path. And uh, we saw that we weren't going to be able to do that full time. And really, I, I stopped thinking about it. About three months ago now, after Raphael had begun this school, he was back in the United States. I saw on Facebook that he was. In fact, he was in Kentucky. And I sent him a message, said, hey, you ever come in, are you going to come through Lexington in the next week or so? Um, well, you're close. I want to meet up with you. I want to hear how things are going. You got the school started. You moved home and all of that. I want to hear how things are going. So we met with him at Barnes & Noble in Hamburg. We sat down, had some coffee. He had some coffee. I had some water. I don't drink the stuff. But uh, first thing he said was, I need you. I want you to come down. And I said, well, Raphael, I can't. I can't. We can't leave. But we've got some family stuff here that we just can't leave. Um, and he said, well, come as much as you can then. I hadn't had found full-time work um, since we left, uh, left Berea. And he put that little plug in my mind, and I kept thinking about it and kept thinking about it. And I said, well, maybe, maybe I haven't found the work because this is what I'm supposed to do. And uh, how, how's that, how am I going to make that happen? So uh, with Jessica's approval and blessing, um, she's letting me go down there. I'm going to make multiple trips throughout the year to go and teach in this school. Let me give you some basic information about Costa Rica and why, why Rafael and, and I and other instructors like myself are going to be doing what we're doing. Costa Rica is a country of about 5 million people, prom predominantly Catholic, um, but also influenced by uh, various Protestant denominations. Um, there, is, there is good uh, political, economic stability. Um, on the news, we're hearing about all these folks that are kind of coming our way from Central America. They're not coming from Costa Rica because Costa Rica is very actually westernized. There's a lot of Amer American companies that, that are down there um, that have many workers and headquarters and things like that. There's a lot of expats that go there to retire. Um, we're not going to the tropical area. We're not going to the rainforest. We're going to a city suburb uh, of San Jose, the capital of the country. But nonetheless, uh, Costa Rica is very stable um, when it comes to all the things that we think about socially and politically and economically. There are 50 churches of Christ within the country right now. None of them have any elders, which means the churches are um, very immature. Uh, in addition to not having elders, about 25% of the churches, established churches, uh, have preachers who are untrained. When you have no elders and deacons, no leadership, and 
many of your preachers are untrained, that opens the door for denominational influence. And so some of the purposes of this school will be to directly train and develop preachers and also to help various leaderships mature. Elders, would-be elders and deacons, uh, might also come to this school um, and get some further training and maturity, we're hoping. Indirectly, um, we're hoping that the school will help to establish congregational independence. Right now, churches worldwide, mission churches, uh, many of them are reliant upon uh, American money from American churches. And we're hoping that in Costa Rica they can be, become more independent as well as uh, combat some of the denominational influences that are, that are there. Um, there is a preacher, preacher training school in Panama. Why, why not have them all go over there? Um, the issue is uh, Panama, the, the, the school that's there is in Panama City, which is the east coast, east side of Panama, and Costa Rica is over here. Many of them, many students, can't just pick up and go across and, and move across their country to another country uh, to train uh, for this. If you have information or know about uh, Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies, used to be East Tennessee School of Preaching, um, the students that go there, they, 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 they leave their job. Uh, they go and they live there full time for two years and, and get trained and then, then they go back. Another reason for establishing a school in Costa Rica is so that it will be dedicated to Costa Rica, not Panama, not Nicaragua or Guatemalan uh, churches. Uh, the, the church or the school that's in Panama is focused on all of most of Latin American uh, countries and, and anybody can go there and we, we have no problem with that. Um, but this is going to be focused on Costa Rica. We're hoping to influence 50 congregations in Costa Rica. So that's some of the, the reasons uh, for the establishment of the school. Um, the school, the students, they are there for two years. They're going to have 48 courses, the equivalent of 164 uh, bachelor hours here, say at UK. Um, they are accredited by Heritage Christian University. It's a two-year program consisting of eight, uh, eight quarters, 10 weeks each. And the students will move from wherever they are and, and come and live there, um, have to rent uh, a place. Maybe they go in together or their family uh, comes, whatever it is, and, and go to school and be there full time, uh, Monday through Friday uh, for two years, uh, eight to five, and then some nights and weekends. My role, uh, at least this next year, I'm going in at the end of January for two weeks, I'll be teaching the Gospel of Matthew and church history, church history one, that's the first 17 centuries of history in two weeks. The second time I go later in the year, I'll be teaching Luke and Mark and also church history, the period of the Reformation and the Restoration. So I'll get to talk about Bourbon County some uh, on that trip. Um, I'll also be teaching Christian and Evanses, the Pentateuch, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude just in this year. Um, the students sacrifice quite a bit. As I said, they, many of them will leave their home, leave their work, whatever it is that they're involved with at the time to come and study uh, for these two years. Financially, uh, part of my role with the school is not only to go and to teach in the school, um, but when I'm stateside, I will be uh, trying to raise support for the school and for the students um, as well as myself. Um, student needs, if they're a single student, they need $600 a month to, to be able to be there for two years. Uh, married, married with children, certain amount of children and all that. The school began this year, January of this year, had 20 students as they opened their doors. Um, we're hoping that obviously there will be more and new students that will begin the program this next January um, and that these current ones will continue on and graduate at the end of next year and, and begin cycling through them. Um, here's how you could help. Uh, you can pray for the work, obviously. Um, if you are able to uh, support the work financially, 
either uh, via my role or Raphael's role. He's not uh, raised all of his support or a student uh, helping to support them uh, and or to make a, a library donation. It's a new school. They're trying to build up their facilities um, and uh, build up their library. Uh, I say all these things. Uh, my, my goal for this year, my, my financial goal, just to be uh, blunt, is at $25,000. Um, 10000 roughly estimated for trips, lodging, food, all of that stuff. Um, a couple thousand for when I need to travel and do the, the fundraising support for the school and whatnot. And then um, I don't know if there's any employer w who would hire a guy who says up front, I need at least eight to 10 weeks off a year so that I can go do my other job. Anybody gonna hire somebody full time like that? Nope. So here's what I've been doing lately. I've been going to the public school and substitute teaching in the high school. And that's no fun by the way. So when I'm stateside, when I'm home, I'm going to uh, try to supplement some of my income um, by doing things like that, um, working on classes, working on fundraising for school students and myself. Uh, and if I can raise 25, you ask where the other 13 come from, uh, if, if I've got uh, that much this year, then it would allow me to have a small personal salary to set back some things for you know, our, our own um, needs cars, house, that kind of stuff that everybody has, right? Um, so that's kind of my goal, and uh, I appreciate the support that, you, that the church has already sent for us. Um, I will tell you, I am working under the oversight of the Roland Hills congregation there, um, and I know that there are uh, many good and worthy causes and that uh, mission work and missionaries come frequently uh, asking for support. Um, and I would certainly not want to take away from any good and worthy cause that you are already doing. Um, if there is uh, ability for you to help um, beyond that though, I uh, certainly would appreciate it and, and love you. I love you anyway, but I, I'd love you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, we would love you and invite you to be a part of this. I have a couple of things. Uh, I didn't, there wasn't a really good place out there to set it. So over close to the office area, uh, there, or there was a cabinetry. Um, I've got a few pieces of information if you would like to pick it up. I also have a, a little sign-up sheet if you'd like uh, to put your email down and receive some updates uh, and pictures and things like that. I won't, I promise you, I won't spam you or give your email address to anybody else uh, so that they can spam you. But if you'd like to get some information that way, uh, just sign up before you leave today. It's, it's back there, um, pieces of information. Um, but I want to finish real quick um, by reading again verses 6 through 8 here of our text who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you would do well. Because they went forth for His name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such people like Demetrius, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. You have a vital part to play in the fulfillment of the gospel and the Great Commission. Whatever that part is, Please don't undervalue whatever it is that you can do. I want to encourage all of us to cultivate those qualities of love for the brethren, commitment to the truth, a devoted walk in that truth, that we would practice faithfulness and thoroughness and hospitableness or hospitality in the meeting the needs, whatever those needs are, that God puts before us. See yourself as a vital part of that great commission of providing support to those who do or can go. And maybe you can. And maybe you do that. Whatever it is that you can do, the work of the great commission, just like the work of Paul's great missionary journeys, cannot be done without all of us doing our part. So whether it's, whether it's me or someone else missionary work that you support, or, or whether it's the work that you do locally, you are doing something for the message of the gospel of Christ, for the Great Commission. Be encouraged in that. Be bold in that. Be strong in that. Whatever it is you do, do it well. And knowing that you're doing it in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus.
I want to in, extend the invitation for anyone who might need to respond to the great commission to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus to, to come back to be a stronger fellow worker, whatever it is, in a public way should you have need. And invite you, if you have questions afterwards, I don't want to take our time now to answer any questions about the work, but if you do, I'll be happy to answer what I can um, before we leave today. But this afternoon, uh, I, I want us all to recognize that we are fellow workers. We are on a team, and our goal is the most noble goal that there is. Should you need help in reaching that goal, why not let us know while we stand and sing? There is no